Greetings, friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church just up the road here, about a quarter of a mile on your left as you're heading back toward Lawrence, out on 221 there. And uh, friends, come out here this afternoon with my friend John. We're here to preach the gospel of grace to you, to bring to you the, the message of life, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is King, that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that Christ has purchased salvation for His people, that He died upon that cross to intercede for transgressors, and that He reigns as King this very day. He reigns as King and as Lord of the universe. And He is worthy of all glory and all praise and all honor. We come out here today to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to call out sin. But also to warn about the wrath of God which is to come upon the wicked. To warn you of what sin will bring you. But also to plead with you to embrace the Savior. Sin is great, yes. And God's wrath is to be feared, yes. But Christ, Christ is a sufficient Savior. And ultimately, we're out here to worship God. This is an act of worship to God, to bring God glory through the preaching of the gospel of His Son. To bring the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, glory and praise and honor. Christ is worthy. Christ is worthy of the glory that is to be brought to Him. Hey, John, those signs over there are falling over. Okay. Just want to let you know. We're out here to be like the apostles in Acts 2. Who evangelized the lost. To be like Peter who preached the gospel in Acts 2. We're here to plead with you concerning your soul. We come out here to have a love for you and a love for God out of gratitude toward God for what He has done for us in Christ, and out of a love for you and a love for your soul, we don't want you to go to hell. Instead, we want you to be received into glory. The gates of heaven are open wide for those who embrace Jesus Christ, for those who are found in Christ. second person of the Trinity. I love what Paul wrote, wrote in Colossians concerning Christ. He said in verse 15 of Colossians 1, he said, He is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through Him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so may Christ be glorified as His gospel is preached this afternoon. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to, the text of Scripture I would like to highlight this afternoon is found in the book of Romans. It is found in Romans chapter 3, in verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes these words, quoting the Old Testament by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Verse 11 reads simply, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. Herein we find this singular verse, which brings two lines of condemnation upon the lost. Which brings two lines of truth concerning lost wretches, concerning sinners. Firstly, that they do not have understanding. That they cannot understand the things of God. That they cannot understand spiritual things. 
And this is true for unconverted souls. That is why people who do not embrace Christ do not embrace Him. That's why people who do not believe on Christ do not believe in Him. It's because they do not and they cannot understand spiritual things. They cannot understand the glory of the Gospel. It is an impossibility for them to do so. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he said, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he will instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Those who are outside of Christ have an inability to understand spiritual things apart from the Holy Spirit of God who gives understanding, who gives spiritual understanding. That's why it is our heart's desire this afternoon that the Spirit of God would grant you understanding of the Gospel as it is preached, as the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is brought forth, that you would understand, you would grasp these truths. And that is only accomplished by the power of the Spirit of God. Man cannot understand spiritual things because of the horror of sin, because of how bad his fallenness is, because of the corruption of his wretched nature. And ultimately we know that's why Christ had to come. Christ had to come to save vile wretches, lost sinners, who could not save themselves. Also, the text mentions the fact that there is no one who seeks for God. And that is true. People are idolaters in their hearts. They desire to only worship false gods. Or perhaps just no God at all. That Instead, they'll just worship themselves. Live for their own pleasure and their own desires. They are bound by idolatry. They cannot seek after the one true God. No one truly does. There may be people who appear on the outside to do so, but inwardly know their hearts are corrupt and perverse. And if there is someone who is genuinely seeking after God, that is only granted by the Spirit of God. Again, we go back to that. That the Holy Spirit is the only one who can grant these things. Can grant this ability. Can grant a lost soul the ability to seek for God. Otherwise, they will not have it. So this text clearly speaks to the depravity, the fallenness of man. And that is true. And ultimately it is that truth which I seek to convey to you this afternoon. That truth concerning man's fallenness. However, that will lead us, that bad news will also lead us to behold the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus saves bad sinners. He saves bad, evil, wicked people. Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so ultimately it is that gospel, the good news that Jesus saves sinners, that is that gospel I which I seek to, to make known to you this afternoon as we look at this passage and others. Before I do, I would like to consider the context of where Paul has come from and where he is going. In Romans chapter 3 here. In the previous verses, in verse 9, he says this, What then are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Paul brings all people under the sweeping condemnation of sin. There's not a single person who's exempt from this whether you're black or white or Hispanic, whether you're rich or poor, whether you have a high place in society or not, you are under sin. You're under the curse of sin. And you need a Savior. You need salvation in Christ Jesus alone. That's why in verse 10 he says, Just as it is written, 
There is none righteous, not even one. Not a single person, not a single person, my friends, has inherent righteousness. That is why Christ had to come. To provide sinners with a justitia alienum. That's Latin for an alien righteousness. A righteousness that is not their own. And truly there is not a one who is righteous. There's not even one. And so therefore that brings us right to the doorstep of verse 11, which is what I want to consider this afternoon. I want to consider the fallenness of man. Consider with me, if you will, verse 11. Paul says, there is none who understands. And now I want you to also note, this is a quotation of the Old Testament. Paul is drawing from Old Testament scriptures as the basis for his apostolic preaching. There's authority to Paul's preaching because he's standing upon the authority of scripture, the authority of the word of God. So he says, there is none who understands. No one understands the things of God. No one can understand these spiritual things. These things concerning the character of God and the law and Christ. And the work of Christ, the benefits of redemption, these truths of the gospel cannot be understood by the lost man. That is why it is absolutely imperative that a man is born again. That you be born again. Friends, if you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said that very thing in John chapter 3. In verse 3, He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Down in verse 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. My friends, it is imperative that the Holy Spirit of God circumcise your heart, that God Himself raise you to spiritual life so that you can understand spiritual things. Otherwise, you will not be able to understand spiritual things. You will not be able to. In fact, if you're outside of Christ right now, you cannot. You cannot understand spiritual things. And the only way you ever could is if the Spirit of God enables you to. Then the second thing he says, going back to Romans 3 in verse 11. The second thing he says there, he says, There is none who seeks for God. How true that is. Let no man claim that he seeks for God truly. Let no woman say that she is a desirer of God. For there is no man or no woman or no child that genuinely seeks after God. They must be sought out by Christ in order to be saved. That's why Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. They are lost, my friends. They know not their way to God. They know not their way to God. And you know not your way to God. You do not know. You cannot understand. And you will not seek for God. You cannot seek for God because you will not seek for God. And then he even adds on to this in the next few verses. He says in verse 11, All have turned aside together, excuse me, verse 12, All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Amen. 
the state of the lost, the state of fallen man is great. But praise be to God that Jesus Christ is a sufficient Savior, that He saves to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. So please, my friends, embrace Jesus Christ. Flee to Christ. Repent of your sin. Flee your pornography and your drunkenness, your rebellion, your selfishness. Flee those things. Flee your adulterous nature and turn to Christ alone. Trust not in your religious performance. Trust not in a church or in a priest, for no man can absolve you of your guilt. Salvation comes by no one else but Jesus Christ. There is none who seeks for God. Not one. This is quite inclusive in the sense that it encompasses all men, but it's also exclusive in the sense that it excludes us from fellowship with God. See, our, our father Adam, the first man, was in communion with God in the garden. There, in, in enjoying the life of God, eternal bliss, perfection in that garden. However, God gave him the free moral agency of his will and gave him the free choice to choose to sin or to choose righteousness. And Adam, our father, fell. He was seduced by the woman to eat the apple, the forbidden fruit. And therefore, all mankind fell into sin. That's why there is none who understands. That's why there's none who seeks for God. That's why there's none righteous. Because sin has entered the world through the sin of one man, the federal head of the human race, Adam. And therefore, we all fell in him. We all fell in him. But we do know that from Scripture, the promise of the last Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the federal head of the church, who represented His people in His life, death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension into glory. My friends, Jesus Christ is a great Savior. A great, great Savior indeed. And so He ought to be embraced. God bless you, ma'am. Praise the Lord. But concerning that last word of verse 11, God. God. Who is God? Who is God? God is triune in nature. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three eternal coexistent persons. And one being in essence in nature, shared by these three persons. One in three and three in one, the glory of the Trinity. The triune God. God is also love. We consider the truth of Scripture. In 1 John 4, 8, we find that very truth. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Three simple words at the end. God is love. That is true. God loves sinners. God is gracious and compassionate. That is also true. He is abounding in loving kindness. He is patient with the wicked. He is patient with sinners, my friends. Patient with sinners. But He's also holy. God is also a holy God, a just God judge a righteous God separated from all that is evil and perverse that's why Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 says a jealous and avenging God is the Lord the Lord is avenging and wrathful the Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies the Lord is slow to anger and great in power and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished and a whirlwind and storm is his way and the clouds are the dust beneath his feet
Verse 4, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bastion and Caramel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake before him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence and the, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who take refuge in Him. But with an overwhelming flood, He will make a complete end of its sight and He will pursue His enemies into darkness. Whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. This chapter, my friends, propounds before us. It brings forth the reality that God is a holy, wrathful God. God's wrath is revealed against the wicked. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. As Proverbs 6 tells us, what does Psalm 5 say? Verse 4, it says, For you are God, not a God, excuse me, who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man a bloodshed and deceit. Friends, God is a wrathful God and He has hatred for the wicked. And the only way that hatred and wrath can be removed is through the, the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is through the, the cleansing that the blood of Christ brings about. It is through the, the redeeming blood of Christ. That is the only way. And we need to understand this, that God in His perfect holiness, in His absolute perfect holiness, has given us His Word, has given us special revelation. We need to understand this. People know God. People know the God of glory. He has revealed His attributes in nature. We see His glory revealed to us in the creation He has made for us to enjoy. We see His wisdom, His power, His might, His strength. We even see aspects of His just character in our own character. God's implanted within us a knowledge of right and wrong that shows us that He is a just and holy God and that He discerns right from wrong. We are made in the image of God. We bear in us the image of God, friends. But that knowledge that is revealed to us in creation concerning the character of God is not enough for salvation. It's not enough for eternal life. That is why God was pleased to reveal to us, uh, uh, to us His Holy Word. To give us the Bible that we could stand upon and therefore know the truth. For Jesus Himself said in John 8, And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth of Jesus Christ frees the soul from sin and from the, the fear of death. People live in fear of death, my friends. People are always trying to escape death. They fear death because they fear hell. They know that they deserve hell for their sins. And all these truths are put forth in Scripture concerning salvation, concerning Christ, concerning eternal life. The Word of God is sufficient for salvation, for life, and for godliness. And so in God's Word, we see God reveal to us His character. And we also see God's character put forth in His law, in His Ten Commandments. Some of these commands are summarized and brought forth by the Lord Jesus in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus is speaking with the rich young ruler. And Jesus says in, in verse 19 of Mark 10, He says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. These commands, my friends, show us the character of God. God's law. If you have ever heard of the Ten Commandments, and, you, and if you have some familiarity with the Ten Commandments, you're familiar with the law of God. That is the law of God. That's God's moral law. 
moral code for us. It's the covenant of works. And that covenant we cannot keep. We cannot work and perform sufficiently as God requires of us to do. But we see these commands and it shows us the character of God. The law of God shows us the character of God. We look at the first one. Do not murder. God is not a murderous God. Therefore, God gives this command. Do not commit adultery. Why does God desire that spouses be faithful to one another? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. The book of Lamentation says that God is faithful. Do not steal. God certainly is not a thief. Certainly does God own all things and have divine prerogative over them. Do not bear false witness. Do not lie. The book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. These show us the character of God. But also the law of God shows us our character in light of the character of God. It's a mirror that shows us two images. One, God's character. And secondly, our character in, the, in light of God's character. Our sin in light of God's holiness. Consider with me those commands. Do not murder. You may say, I've never committed murder. Jesus said in Matthew 5, that if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, it's equated with murder. God sees you as a murderer in your heart. So therefore, if you have unjustified anger in your heart towards someone, if you've ever hated someone in your heart, you've committed murder in your heart. You're guilty. Do not commit adultery. You may say again, I've never committed adultery. However, Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and said, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Or for you women, if you look at a man with lust, if you watch things on television you know are dishonoring to God, you look at women inappropriately, that is adultery of the heart. And God sees it as such. Friends, you're guilty before God. That's why you need Jesus Christ to save you. You need eternal life. I, that's why I need Christ to save me. Because I'm a vile, wretched sinner, just as you are. We need a Savior, my friends. And Jesus died for sinners and was raised on the third day. And all who embrace Him, all who embrace Christ, will have eternal life. Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen something? Irrespective of the value of the item, if you've stolen, you've stolen and you're guilty. Do not bear false witness. Have you ever lied? You ever lied towards someone? Then you have broken the command. You deserve hell. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Friends, I don't want you to go there for your sins. So therefore, we have this guilt. We find ourselves having broken the law of God, having trampled the law of God underfoot, having acted unrighteously and sinfully. Therefore, we deserve punishment for our sin. What is God's punishment for sin? Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, he said this concerning the wicked. These will go away into eternal punishment. Friends, the eternal punishment that Christ is speaking of is hell. Hell is the place for the wicked. Hell is where you are going, my friends. I cry out to you on your way to destruction to look to Jesus Christ for your only hope. He is the hope for the world. He is the light of the world. And he who believes in him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, my friends. Hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of great torment and pain and agony for the wicked, a place of torture, a place where the wicked receive upon themselves the just penalty for their law-breaking.
Hell is a real place, my friends, and I do not want you to go there. I don't want you to perish in your sins. I don't want you to go to hell and be damned for your sin. said, I want you to have eternal life. And so therefore we are all condemned to this place of torment and agony without any hope. We have no hope inherently, no hope in ourselves. We are condemned. We are condemned. But praise be to God. Praise be to the God of glory. That that is not where the story ends. No, the story does not end there. This is where the good news comes in. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God so loved sinners. There is a great love that God has for His people. And so in, in God's great love for His church, He sent Jesus Christ into the world to save sinners, to save those people who were condemned to hell without any hope. Galatians 4, 4 tells us when the fullness of the times came God sent forth His Son the second person of the Trinity Jesus Christ the eternal God man Christ came into the world to save vile wretched sinners sinners like you and me and Jesus came and bought salvation for His church He fulfilled the law of God as Matthew 5 17 tells us he came to fulfill the commands that we broke. To live in absolute, perfect, full, complete, utter obedience to the law of God. In absolute conformity to it. And then not only did He fulfill the law for us, something we could not do, but He put away our guilt too. He paid for our guilt. At the right time, Christ laid down His life as the Lamb of God, as a ransom for many. And He bore the wrath of God upon the cross for His church. He bore the wrath of God for His people. Upon that cross, the Father treated His Son as if He was a sinner. As if he was a lawbreaker, though in fact he was perfect, though in fact he was absolutely perfect and righteous. That's why Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves have seen him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. Listen to verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. On 
on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of the Father was satisfied upon that cross. Every ounce of the wrath of God that we deserve to take upon ourselves for all eternity was put on Jesus Christ. Every ounce. And so that we can say truly, Jesus in His death accomplished salvation for His people. After three days in the tomb, the Father rose Him up as a public display that He had received His atoning work at the cross as a sufficient payment for our sins. That what Jesus did upon that cross was enough. That He had truly, fully, completely bought salvation by His precious blood. And after 40 days of further ministry among His beloved disciples, what happened? Christ ascended bodily into glory, and He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. He has completed the work of salvation once for all. It is done. It is done. <clears throat> he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, something that a high priest was never to do, but Christ did it because the work was done. He had already offered up His own self for the sin of the church, the sin of the world. And so the call of the gospel, the call of the gospel, my friends, is that one must repent and believe it. That's why in Mark 1.15, Jesus said these words. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So you must repent, you must turn from sin, turn from rebellion and selfishness, turn from pride, and then believe the gospel. Believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Take God at His word, and you will be saved. Be like Abraham, who when he heard the word of God was converted. He was saved. One text that affirms the validity of his faith is in Genesis 15:6. It says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He credited, credited the righteousness. Thank you. God bless you. He credited to him foreign righteousness. And he was saved. He was saved eternally saved because he believed the Word of God that's the call of the gospel my friends that's the challenge for you is you must believe the gospel and if you do that the promise is that God will forgive you of all sin past present and future on account for Jesus sake on account of the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and the Father will credit to your account the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ the perfect righteousness of his son God will look upon you as if you lived Jesus' life because He looked upon Christ as if you lived your life, if you're His. If you're His. He takes my sin, I receive His righteousness. He takes my filth, I get that perfect garment of righteousness to my account. So that God looks at me as if I am righteous. 
the Lord reigns. Psalm 9, 7 says, But the Lord abides forever. He has established His throne for judgment, and He will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. All who find refuge in the Lord will not be turned away. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's an aspect of repentance and faith, friends, is that you're broken over your sin. You're broken over your rebellion. You're broken over your pride. You're broken over your sin, my friends. That's an aspect of salvation. The call is to repent and to believe and God will pardon you and adopt you as one of His children, adopt you as a child of God, as one of His very own. Because of the work of Jesus Christ. This is all by grace. Salvation is all of the free grace and free mercy of God. It is not of the work or merit of man. Do not listen to the Roman Catholic Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons. Believe the Bible. Believe what the Word of God says. It says it is by grace through faith. It's exactly what Ephesians 2 says. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God shows favor and kindness toward those who do not deserve it and who did not earn it. That's salvation. That God allows a sinner to enter into glory because of the work of Jesus Christ which was performed in grace. Christ is the perfect manifestation of the grace of God. And the one who has been truly regenerate, the one who has been truly born again will bear fruit of that. That's something that people need to understand here in the South. Not everyone who says they know Jesus truly knows Jesus. In fact, many who sit in churches today in Lawrence County are on their way to hell, are on their way to damnation. Many who sit in churches this coming Sunday are on their way to hell. They think they know Christ, but they're self-deluded. They're deceived. That's why in 1 John 4, 8 it says, the one who does not love does not know God. The one who does not love does not know God. I apologize for that, brethren. I'm very lightheaded. <laughs> Excuse me. First John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. The one who truly knows Christ will bear fruit of it in their life. And the one who says they know Christ but does not bear fruit of it is lost. They're self-deceived. They're deluded. And they know not Christ. They know not His love. And this gospel is not only for the lost, but it is for the saint. It is for the child of God. To feed upon daily, day after day after day. It is for the child of God to feast upon as their manna from heaven. It is all by grace. Salvation is all by grace. So that God gets all the glory. So that God receives all praise and all worship and all honor. 
That's why Paul says at the end of Romans, in Romans 16, 25, he says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. It is all to the glory of God. Amen and amen. So you who are lost, I exhort you to flee to Christ. You who are religious, I exhort you to examine yourselves. And if you see that you bear fruit of conversion, praise God, you're saved. And if not, you're lost. And for my brethren who are truly converted, it is my encouragement to you to rest in the gospel today and to preach the gospel to the lost for the glory of God the Father. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, Verse 11, that there is none who understands and that there is none who seeks for God. That man is truly fallen. And even though we're fallen, Christ is a great Savior and He saves those who have fallen far and who deserve hell for their sins. Jesus is a sufficient Savior. We've seen how He died and rose again for His people and all who embrace Christ will be saved forevermore by the grace of God and to the glory of God. So to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory and praise and honor forever and ever and ever. Amen and amen.